let's just get underway here because I know we've got a full schedule of conversation and questions, but we also have mm -hmm, delicious vino. Uh, and I'm super excited for you to uh, tell us about uh, Solvero. Um, I think Summerland is an awesome area. I loved visiting this summer and seeing the Garnet Valley kind of area because it was really kind of a bit of an extreme uh, awareness that I'd been there before and a little bit out of the way. And it's got some elevation and that's super exciting. So um, let's just, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about, I don't know, what's the most exciting thing? How you got into wine? I think that's super interesting. Sure. Yeah, it's been um, quite an adventure, uh, a long road, um, but a, a pretty fantastic one. I'm glad uh, life took me in this direction. Um, I was kind of a, a science geek uh, through high school, and uh, my first university degree was in microbiology, actually. So sort of fortuitous that it had, like yeast is a uh, microbe uh, that I studied, uh, yeah. but I didn't really have any relationship uh, to winemaking or wine growing at that point. Um, to help pay for that degree, I started working at a restaurant, um, ended up at a fine dining restaurant with a really um, focused wine program. Uh, and the owner there uh, was a song and he offered a, a course for the, the staff and I just fell in love with it. And I mean, isn't that just a perfect combination um, to transition from, I worked as a sommelier uh, in Halifax at that time for a couple of years, and then uh, wanted to combine the science with the sensory part of it. Um, mm -hmm. So I went back to school and did a degree in enology and viticulture. And uh, Where did yeah. you do your degree? Uh, Brock University, okay. which is, it's the only one in Canada that has the full um, Bachelor of Science program um, in enology and viticulture. So I did the full deal, which was over four years. Mm -hmm. uh, and the work term uh, sort of co-op placement that was a part of that program is what brought me out to BC, actually, and then uh, oh, fell in love good. with the region here. And, uh, never looked back. Hard not to fall in love with the, the Okanagan Valley. Or you're right about that. Oh, beautiful. Okay, so Halifax, was that a home? Was that an or place of origin? Were you raised in Halifax? Or were you I in grew up in Ontario. So mm -hmm. moved to Halifax to go to university. Um, Dalhousie had a really strong mm -hmm. science program. So that's what drew me there. Um, it's where I got into wine. Thought mm -hmm. I might make, I thought ultimately I would likely make wine in either Nova Scotia or Ontario. Mm -hmm. And then lo and behold, I'm out on the West Coast and loving wow. it. So trans transcontinental, look at you. Uh, <laughs> I cover East, West, in between. <laughs> we have a, a vast and beautiful country. That's for Is sure. Is that true? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was really impressed with uh, uh, Nova Scotia wine, uh, visiting Benjamin Bridge, uh, Blomidon, and Light Heart. Light, light, light Heart and Wolf. Light. Yes. Light Foot. foot and Wolf. Yeah. Foot. Yes, and uh, made it to uh, what Prince Edward County. Great. Uh, um, it is a very different landscape, and uh, certainly a different. It felt more, uh, more and sort of uh, closed in, a little hemmed in, uh, smaller for sure. Uh, haven't done the Niagara piece, so that that's on my horizon. But when you arrived in British Columbia, you must have been like, where was the first place you landed? like uh winery wines you yeah. mean or just in general uh a Soyuz Loros yeah and it was it was the first it sort of was like a sign for me when that um, job placement uh came up as an opportunity because the Soyuz Loros happens to be the first Canadian wine that I truly loved and like recognized the potential for what we could do here wow. um of course I've discovered so so many since but uh it just seemed um like it was meant to be when that job opportunity came up. So I had to sign up for that and uh, did eight months um, in part of it in the vineyard and then did a vintage uh, in 2008 and actually back again in 2009. So what were you thinking? You know, I have two science degrees and uh, I'm going out West and uh, everybody is cheering for you. And, uh, and then you get to the Okanagan and like summer is amazing. Yeah. I mean, 
It was great. It was, uh, to be perfectly honest, there, um, it was scary uh, to move <laughs> someplace completely different where I didn't know anyone and just, okay, I'm doing this. I'm going to see, yeah. you don't really know entirely what you're signing up for. Yeah. Um, luckily it was phenomenal. And of course the people here, the industry um, is so warm and welcoming that it was a non-issue, but to make that decision and then just, you know, get in my car and drive across the country with all my stuff. Um, yeah, how, it was a big did, move. How did you do an interview in 2008 and nine? I mean, uh, was like a phone call yeah. or, right? Like, uh, like, uh, that would be like here's my resume. And then they would write you back saying, well, this is great. Like, yeah, I think I did. If I'm remembering correctly, I emailed with Catherine Scott Taggart, who is now a good friend of mine. Awesome. Um, she was the assistant winemaker to Sotheby's La Roche then. And I think I sent my resume. We corresponded a bit via email and then did a phone call. And that was it. Yeah. Yeah. Now it's not Zoom and uh, four people in a board, you know, room like uh, meeting. But I think I think we all need to start in a place. And I think that would have been a great introduction to the Okanagan for a couple of reasons. One is they only make two styles of wine. Yeah. And if anybody has shown us, especially those who believe we should have one grape variety that is our, you know, masthead, um, they did a great job with kind of setting that tone. And then of course, going out and winning awards and having all that spotlight. I mean, you know, it was yeah. a great way to start. It, how how did that spark your imagination for what could be? Yeah, I think just the complexity, the depth of concentration, the ripeness level, mm -hmm. the richness of those wines. Um, yeah, it, it really just spoke to the potential of this region. Um, and I do love what you said about, about focus. I think um, BC has the ability to grow a, a wide variety of different grapes depending on where you're situated like uh you know west Kelowna, for example is very different than a soyuz mm -hmm. but to be focused and selective on what you do well on your site um i think is a critical part of of what we do and uh, for example our um focus at solvero is very um dedicated to pinot no pinot noir and chardonnay and a little bit of pinot green and that speaks to your strengths because after Osuyus La Rose, you went to Stoneboat. Okay. I uh, started. What vintage, what, so, what vintages did you do Osuyus La Rose? 2008 and 2009. Right. Okay. And paid my dues, you know, cellar rat, rack and digging tanks out and doing all the, the stuff, which I still do and um, still love to be hands on. Uh, not quite as much so, but. Uh, yeah, then went to um, Stoneboat for the 2010 through 2014 vintages. Um, kind of worked my way up from assistant winemaker to winemaker for the latter four years. Uh, and then a job opportunity came up at Liquidity. Uh, so did the 2015 through 2020 vintages there. So six vintages at each uh, yes, and you and I met uh, when you were a winemaker at Liquidity because I was at Legacy Liquor Store, and yeah. and um, the styles of Chardonnay and the profile of Chardonnay coming out of Liquidity at the time was just stellar, and uh, so for me it was really exciting to meet you, and I think there was an award that had just been won, or <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I that was yeah it was a, a big one for us the chardonnay du monde became uh, as the top the top rated wine at that competition uh for our 2016 vintage which was was quite exciting um and again i think speaks to the potential for canadian wines on mm -hmm. a, not just uh in canada but on a world stage 100 percent, 100 percent. um so then you were at liquidity for six years That's and right. things happened and then all of a sudden i was like solvero allison wow amazing was there something in between did you you know 
no, I went straight there. I'd actually been following what uh, Silvera is owned by the Sartor family, um, founded by Matt Sartor, uh, who found this property out in Garnet Valley and really had the vision for what it could become. Um, and he, uh, so this was, uh, I mean, it's a, a new winery, but it doesn't feel yeah. so new to us because it's been a decade in development. Um, and he would come to liquidity with me and taste barrels when he was like doing clonal selections for what he was going to plant. So, uh, I feel like, you know, I was sort of a spectator for the, the first formative years. And then, uh, when the production facility was almost done and the, winemaking side of it was getting to a point where they needed a full-time winemaker um it seemed like the right fit for me yeah i love uh first of all uh, i'm super excited uh that you're involved uh because i think it speaks to your expertise um the story behind uh you know hand auguring uh you know holes to plant vines on this how many acres is it and uh, the total acreages is 30, um, but it's a very steep, high elevation vineyard. If you can picture this with um, the vineyard blocks are broken up by a series of gullies and tree lines, which are left intact. Uh, so of the 30 acres, 16 is planted. And that's the maximum. And so I recall the elevation like is steep, like uh, it to hand auger and plant the upper bench there. Uh, must have taken like, I don't know, like, like, uh, it felt like it should have taken an army of men. And here's, you know, a dad and his son uh, going through the motions. So um, a real passion project is what it felt like when I visited and when I chatted with Matt. 100%. Yeah, it's not uh, certainly not an easy vineyard to farm. Mm -hmm. um, just the steepness alone. Um, and even we call the top block K2 because it is just so steep, like 30 <laughs> degree slope, uh, so specialized, <laughs> specialized tractor to get up there. And the bedrock is very close to the surface. So, you know, planting uh, everything um, on, a, on a topography like that is, is more effort, more work, but the um, quality of the grapes, I think, reflect the effort that's put in. Well, that I could taste it. Uh, so I'm just going to set the tone. So I drove along, I drove off of Highway 97. I don't remember what my off road was, but I just remember winding once I got off uh, Jones Flat Road, I think. So you kind of come up over a crest and you come down and it's like a, a winding road that you get on two lanes. You're in the middle of a valley uh, or a, a very narrow sort of long valley and you're winding along that road. And suddenly it's like, oh, around a corner, around a bend, you know, there's farms down below and there's like mountains right to, you know, your extreme uh, left and right. And so it it's like there's Solvero and you you kind of you drive up and it's there's like a you know asphalt driveway but this beautiful like set back winery that's like wood and concrete and very open and surrounded by like construction like where it's a little bit of a construction site when I was there it felt like because some parts hadn't been finished yet like the tasting room and we had this beautiful improvised out in the fresh air kind of tabletop with four bottles and then you introduced me to the wines and I just remember thinking like this is super special so maybe you could talk a little bit about acreage and soil types and like what we get and what's unique because there's limited sunlight and you know like there's some things I noticed but I'm not an expert in this I'm just kind of an observer and I like to share the story so uh, if you want to maybe take us on a little adventure of Solvero and kind of what sets it apart that'd be awesome yeah absolutely well um as you mentioned, it's a it's a bit of an undiscovered gem, Garnet Valley in general. Um, yeah. It's actually not very far off the highway, about five minutes off the highway. But this really charming winding road through farmland, ranches, uh, there is some other grapevines planted. And then there is another winery in the region. I should plug uh, Garnet Valley Ranch as well. There are our neighbors. So a couple of places to come out and visit uh, in Garnet Valley. Um, but yeah, Solvero has been uh, in development, as I said, for a decade, 
uh, with the vineyards. Uh, the winery production building started going up in 2021. Uh, and you'll be happy to know there's no more construction. We just finished the tasting room and we'll be opening up that space uh, to host guests uh, this season. So last year, we did open our doors to welcome people and share our wines, but it was a bit more of a behind the scenes uh, on the production side. So we were sitting mm -hmm. on the crash pad. Mm -hmm. uh, this okay. year, we're still going to offer that experience to tour yeah. through the facility through the eyes of a winemaker. Uh, but we also have uh, a very peaceful um, outdoor and indoor seating area with the beautiful views over um, the, the hills of Garnet Valley. So it's a very different landscape than anywhere else in the Okanagan. It feels mm -hmm. like you've transported to a completely different area. The, mm -hmm. the trees are all ponderosa pine. It's, it's yeah. uh, even the, the wildlife is very different um, in, in this region, just so close to the main Okanagan. The Gar Garnet Valley is a, a smaller, slightly more narrow valley that uh, runs parallel to the Okanagan. Uh, and that's one of the things that sets it apart. Um, we get about, on average, maybe 15, 20 minutes less sunlight per day. Uh, and it's why Matt selected Pinot Noir um, as a focus there. Um, because what it translates to is really nice development, full uh, flavor development, physiological ripeness in the grape at lower sugar levels than you see elsewhere um, in, BC, in, in the Okanagan. Right. Um, yeah. So you'll because be surprised. The Okanagan, like the Okanagan, I mean, I've you know, it can get what 40 degrees Celsius. I don't know if it gets that in the vineyard. It feels like to me, if you had Pinot Noir anywhere south of, you know, Summerland, it would just like unless you had a high elevation and lots of protection, it would it would get very right very quickly and be kind of come kind of that not jam bomb, but it just wouldn't have the finesse. And aren't we looking for finesse and elegance when it comes to Pinot Noir? And isn't that how we do it, right? Like the things you're talking about. I think so. I mean, everybody has different goals and different stylistic vision for what they're doing. But yeah, that's what drew me to the, uh, to Silvero is this, um, yeah, true cool climate viticulture uh, with great varieties that are suited to that. What kind of elevation are you at? Like how high up, uh, like, I don't know. Uh, when I would visited Garnet Valley Ranch, I think they said that at the highest point, they're at 2,200 feet. Uh, that surprised me. Yeah, I don't think in, okay, you can do the conversion for me. I'm thinking in meters, but mm, um, okay. I think Gar Garnet Valley is, Valley Ranch is similar. We're, our maximum is, I, I believe, 650, 650 meters. I always just multiply by three. <laughs> Close <laughs> enough. Probably, yeah. Yeah, you know me. Uh, so, so, you know, about 1,850 or, you know, 2,000 feet. Well, yeah. yeah. A little more yeah. than that. Yeah, 2,400. Yeah. Uh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, Garnet Valley Ranch is definitely not uh, 2,400. It could be 22. I think their number is around 680 as a maximum, but don't quote me on that. So I, uh, okay. I don't want to speak for them. And but, you're, um, you're doing, so you're doing three grape varieties. You're at about 650 meters. You've got 20 plus acres. Yeah. So uh, we've got go ahead. two vineyards. So 16 acres on the Garnet Valley site. We have a second property called Happy Valley. Uh, and then we just planted a, another four acres that we're leasing as well. So it'll total uh, 24 acres. Wow. So what, you know, uh, so we're not quite at the winemaking part yet, but when you've spent time in the vineyard, so what uh, uh, tonnage, like what are we looking at for a yield off of a vineyard like this? So Garnet Valley is a very low yielding vineyard. Um, that partly is to do with the age of the vines because younger vines uh, typically produce less and if they tried to produce more, we would reduce that tonnage. So right. not to stress them too much. We don't, you don't yeah. want to overdo it with young vines. So uh, we've been averaging about a ton and a, to a ton and a half um, from Garnet Valley. I'd like to see it um, eventually at uh, about two and a half tons an acre. I think that's achievable uh, and still hitting quality mark that, that we want. It'll be the right balance. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's the goal eventually, but we're not, we're not rushing anything. We're not quite there yet. 
Well, yeah. uh, what's the horizon looking like? So is that a development again over another decade that it's going to take the vines, you know, that much time to become mature enough to produce a kind of fruit? So. Yeah, I, interesting um, you bring that up because I think this year is going to be a bit of a turning point um, for us and perhaps the industry in general. Um, I, I'm not sure if you're aware or um, how aware you are of I've the heard some winter. Things. Please tell us what you're tell us what you're seeing because it's quite scary. Yeah, I was actually just at a meeting uh, before uh, before this with a, a large group of industry representatives to talk about what the situation is and what our path forward is. Um, and really, until the spring, we don't really know 100 percent what we're looking at. So it is a little bit of a waiting game, but we're trying to be proactive um, in January, mid January early January, um, we had an extreme cold weather event um, and vines are relatively hardy plants, but they um, are affected by um, cold temperatures when they hit a certain, uh, a certain threshold. Uh, and we hit below that threshold for a sustained period of time. And um, there's something that we can do to assess now um, damage that has occurred it's called bud dissection so basically you go out and take samples of um, canes or last year's um, growth um, and then you can cut the buds open and if they're green inside they're healthy and viable and if they're not that means um, they're they're dead um, and there's different there's different bud types i won't get into all that technical stuff but um, the results that we're getting this year is 100 percent bud death um, so that potentially means no crop for this year. I should point out that that is, that is very different than vine death. So bud death means that they won't produce grapes, but we can lay down new uh, material for the following year and, and potentially recover uh, in the following year. So we're looking at little to um, no harvest potentially in 2024. Uh, for so come fall 2024 um, and you know we're a resilient industry so we're coming together uh, to talk about solutions and, and what that might mean and what it looks like moving forward so did you make enough wine last year and uh, that it's maybe possible to continue selling the inventory you have of course that doesn't set you up for next year but like or is this a this is a sold out we sold everything and so now we're yeah, we were lucky in 2023. We actually um, did our biggest harvest to date. And uh, I, I do have bottled some wine and I do still have some wine in tank that uh, can get us through uh, to a reasonable degree. Um, so to answer your question, it's kind of a little bit of both. We're going to be short on some yeah. and um, we'll have enough inventory to get us through on, on some other things. But um, all of that handwork that Matt did, like, I guess we can only hope that there's no vine death and that it is just bud death because uh, that's a big that's a big challenge if it's if it's greater than just a harvest it's still a painful i'm sure i can't imagine um yeah it's uh it's pretty heartbreaking um yeah. you know and it's uh it's industry-wide in, in this instance that's like the I'm reports are the same from north to south um so you don't wish that on anyone, but there is um, there is strength in the whole industry coming together to work together. And that's, um, I think that's the silver lining. Like that's exactly what's happening. You know, people are coming together to be supportive of each other. And mm -hmm. um, there might be some uh, temporary regulation changes that are coming down the pipeline to make sure that your favorite BC wineries can keep the lights on um, for a year uh, until we can get our uh, our estate vineyards back online and um, producing a full crop. Could, could you ever imagine this when you were studying that you might be faced with this kind of situation? Honestly, there were so many things that didn't occur to me when I was studying um, to be a winemaker. I uh, admittedly didn't know the ex exactly what I was getting into, right? Like, <laughs> I love wine, you know, it's a beautiful thing that, that I want to be a part of. That's, that's what I knew. Um, and then the reality of farming 
hits pretty quickly. Um, but this is probably the most significant challenge that we faced. Yeah. Farming is, uh, you know, I think a lot of people it used to be that they were religious because they had no control over what was going to happen with their crop. And so that all kind of made sense to me. But, you know, we've really moved away living in the city and you kind of move away from your connection to soil and farming. And we still need to eat, though. And like I love I love wine because there's a whole provenance around being in a place and feeling a place and touching the earth and looking at the vine. And, you know, it's just very, for me, uh, connected. But I grew up on a farm. So, you know, I, I, I don't know that that's very unique, um, but it's kind of my uh, thing. I. I guess what I was hoping uh, maybe you and I would get into is, um, so Solvero is a new undertaking. Uh, I loved meeting up and tasting last year. I really want to kind of talk about you. Uh, what's it like for a woman in the wine business? Have you ever, like, what's your take on that? And especially if there's like people listening, they're like, I really want to get into wine. Like, well, you know, there's a whole, there's a whole conversation about what do you do? Like, yeah. uh, where, where's the pathway? Is there a pathway? Yeah. You know, how are women supported? Are they supported? Does it even matter? Um, cause I would say you're young and strong and physically fit and you're out in the vineyards and you're like, got your boots on. I was like, you know, blunt stones and blue jeans, like, woohoo, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a vibe, right? Exactly. Totally. It's, yeah. it's, you know, and yes, you can dress up and go to an event and be in the city and do all that stuff, but you're, it's a, I don't want to say it's a hard life, but there's a lot of uh, physicality to it, which I always have loved, but that's not for everyone. And uh, so I don't know, maybe there's ways that you like to talk about being a woman in it, what the energy of a woman brings, what the sensitivities are. I mean, I've heard that women are better tasters. <laughs> I did a, my thesis at Brock on differences in taste perception uh, with a, looking at gender. And statistically, women rate more sensitivity to taste and smell, whether that translates to an actual, you know, superior ability. I'm, well, you know, but, but that's so interesting because I believe women have uh, 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 just a sensitivity that's slightly different from men. And that's a very big generalization. So I have to be careful. But I, I believe there's also a confidence that you have to have as a taster that somehow I sense men have more than women because I see some of these tasting events where it's a competition at Psalms and all the law. And there's like two women and like a dozen men. It's like, are women just not putting their hands up or is there, are they just not confident enough? Are they, you know, like, cause I think it could be a uh, uh, wonderful to see more women in all aspects of the industry. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I mean, I would venture to say that confidence is a component of that. I still struggle with it sometimes myself, you know, overthinking something before I actually put my, my hand up to voice it and, you know, then by then somebody else has already um, brought it up and, you know, it's, yeah, like, oh, I missed my opportunity. But uh, yeah, I think women are fairly well, fairly well represented in BC. It's certainly not like a 50-50 breakdown, but uh, I feel like there is a good representation. Uh, there are programs to help support uh, women in wine. Um mm -hmm to become winemakers uh, or work in any aspect of the industry, whether that's sales or management uh, vineyard, um, which is probably a place where women are less well represented. So that's changing as well. Um, are these I've like had, government programs or university programs or what's the... Uh, I'm talking about, um, I think it's called Les Dans. Oh, scholarship. Descoffier, yeah. So that And BC Hospitality Foundation. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, there's also a new one that I saw that Pete Marshall and his wife, uh, Monique Chung and their son. Yes. Yeah. He's our he's our sales representation on uh, in the I Lower Mainland. I love that. Yeah. Pete, yay, Pete, yay. Yay, Pete. Yeah, they're just like. They're uh, lovely. Yeah. yeah. Well, that means you'll be in all the right places with all the right people tasting. I think so. It's going well so far. Yeah. Is Silvero making 
natural wine or conventional wine or loot raisin like where do we fit in the scheme of yeah um, it's um i don't like to put a name definition because some of these things aren't regulated anyway so you can right. call them natural and natural to somebody other than me but somebody <laughs> else might define it differently than i do for example um if I were to describe our philosophy, if I had to put a word on it, it would be sustainable uh, and and uh, truth and transparency uh, in everything we do. Um, most of the work is done in, in the vineyard. Um, and then I'm trying to translate what is provided to me on the crush pad into the most authentic version of that. Um, I'm not really using any additives. Uh, I do a lot of um, what we'll call spontaneous fermentations. So the natural yeast populations, uh, I'm giving them the opportunity to um, ferment on their own and only intervening if necessary. Um, we're not doing a lot of fining. I do filter the wines, um, but I often, the, the term natural wine almost implies that other types of wine are unnatural and um, yeah, I, I, we're not doing anything that isn't, uh, an authentic representation of, of the place where we are. It's interesting because in the food business, which I was a part of for a couple of decades, uh, using the term natural was eliminated. You can't call a product natural anymore, uh, mm. simply because it implies something that can't be kind of quantified really without a long yeah. list. And even then, uh, you know, it implies something that is then used in a different way. Uh, so, you know, is it a natural process? Well, you know, I don't know, I'm not going to come up with a good example at the moment, but you know, it's a, it has a, it has a personality of its own that can be conflicted. And so they abandoned it uh, at least because there became a channel in the grocery business called natural foods. Yeah. You know? So a whole misnomer because, you know, under that, came a few other things. But so when we talk about wine, um, I think a minimalist is kind yeah. of, you, you sound like someone who has a lot of care and attention and is, because you know what's supposed to happen, you can also be the person who guides and shepherds and watches and responds. Is, is that kind of? Very well said. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. how I would phrase it. So you're, um, like the, you're like the mama to the wines. Hey kids, get on board. Well, they certainly keep me up at night sometimes. That's that's for sure. Uh, yeah. Always on my mind. What yeah. is this? What is the stress that a winemaker is thinking about? Oh gosh. At three in the um, morning. I try uh, certainly not to worry about anything unnecessarily, but um, firstly, things that are out of my control, I try and just put that aside. You know, I can't control. The winter temperatures so there's no point in fretting over it you just have to look at situation mm -hmm. and make the best decision moving forward and that's how i i treat everything uh, every vintage is is different mm -hmm. um so there's always a level of nerves going into every vintage because you don't know what you're going to encounter what kind of pressures might be in the vineyard there's um you know in humid years we might have a little bit of mildew pressure so trying to be on top of that um and just blending decisions. Um, I'll do a series of, it's, that's one of the, the most time consuming and detail oriented part of my job. It's also probably the most artistic part where you're um, taking, let's say I've got 50 Pinot Noir barrels. I consider each one of those barrels a unique component of what will become our final Pinot Noir. So I'll do a series of blending trials um, over the course of several weeks, combining different uh, different proportions of each thing to try and come up with the best version of what we're trying to showcase. And so there's always that level of, you know, yeah. am I, is this the, is this the right direction? Oh my um, gosh. Yeah. And just because thinking about that. 50 barrels could be 50 combinations times, I don't know, what's the exponential calculation yeah. of that, right? It's like, oh no. There's 2,500 combinations here, whatever, whatever the number is. Like it's, it's a lot. It is. Yeah. So how did you learn to taste? Uh, the way I, I found that the way that I learned how to identify um, different taste descriptor, descriptors and profiles and wine was, it was practice yeah. and doing things side by side. So 
I understand how, you know, you taste one glass of wine and then another glass of wine six weeks later, yeah. you don't have that side-by-side -side comparison that highlights the differences. So yeah. just practice flights of wine side-by-side -side, uh, and yeah, identifying, you know, some of the key ones that are like Eureka moments are probably more obvious, um, you know, Sauvignon Blanc and like the grassy herbaceous character that that brings. There's certain ones that are like really identifiable. Um, and then you kind of nail those down. Uh, and then the more, the more subtle nuances come uh, closely afterwards. So Right. Like I've got Sancerre and Sauvignon Blanc in a glass. So which one is which? Yeah. But is that a good segue into maybe tasting? Because you were kind enough to send me something lovely, which is yeah, our Pinot Gris. Pinot Gris. Yeah. Difference between Pinot Gris and Pinot Grigio. Do we want to talk about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, to be honest, you, maybe you know more than I do about this, but Pinot Gris is, um, versus Pinot Grigio indicates a stylistic difference. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, um, it's Notice more commonly this. named that in like Italy commonly uses Pinot Grigio uh, and Alsace would use Pinot Gris. And, right. Notice the slopey shoulder bottle. I mean, there's many ways to communicate the stylistic character of wine. Um, Pinot Grigio is usually a little high shoulder, you know, Bordeaux bottle. Uh, and Pinot Gris tends to, like, if, Al if you think of Alsace, you know, those flutes are, I mean, elegant. and uh, Pinot Gris can ripen in Alsace. Oh my gosh, the story is crazy. Over the last 30 years, it's... Uh, a one day earlier harvest so now they're harvesting 30 days earlier than they did and the alcohol and right so the alcohol is rising to like 15 percent because these grapes accumulate so much sugar way more sugar than they were ever able to manage so it's quite an interesting story and it was a considered kind of a cool climate the you know the mountains were protecting you know like this uh um uh what do you call it a rain shadow much like what you would have have, I'm guessing in Garnet Valley because you've you know you've got high elevation you're a little bit more to the west of the Okanagan Valley yeah. anyway yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to pour I don't know if you've got something there so this already is the, I'm way ahead of you Barb <laughs> <laughs> 2022 Solvero Pinot Gris uh so Garnet Valley is a sub AVA now is it not uh, it's not specifically called Garnet Valley um, sub GI. It is uh, Summerland Valleys. Summerland, of Summerland Valley. Valleys. Does it say yeah. Summerland Valley on here? Uh, it does not because this was bottled, I think, just before that became. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, this is so going forward, though, on your bottles, we will see that it says Summerland Valley. Yeah. Yes. That's that's cool. that's Mm -hmm. Yeah, Summerland, um, for listeners that may not know, now has three distinct sub-geographical areas, which I think is really cool. And um, this year, actually 2023, I did have fruit um, grapes from all three sub-GIs. And I would like to, and I think there is um, uh, the raw materials to work with this year to create a, a series of Pinot Noirs that reflect the different regions. Wow. So just within be, Summerland, just within Summerland, very, that's, very different wines. That's the, that's the two glasses or three glasses side by side. Uh, like, can we identify where in the world we are? Like, that's amazing. Yeah. So that, it's that's very, very I mean, that's geeky, but you know, that's very fun. So this one says happy Valley Summerland 3.5 tons per acre uh planted in 2001 is that right or am i reading yeah 2001 250 250 cases yeah and then this detail which is lovely for all of those people who like nerdy information 50 percent neutral french oak and 50 percent stainless steel and i like both but i think uh, a little oak on pinot gris adds a complexity and an age ageability component to it. Am I right? Am I wrong? What What do you think? 100%. Um, so I'd like to just point out that just because something has oak on it or oak was used in um, the process of making it, 
doesn't mean that the wine necessarily smells oaky. We def, uh, specify neutral oak because um, this wine, the 50% uh, was fermented in older barrels that contribute that texture, that ageability without giving any of that oak flavor. Um, so the strategy was to, to build a texture. No oak was uh, noticed or remarked on the aromas of this wine. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I the previous vintage I did uh seventy five percent in barrel in neutral barrel, and it was a bit too much. It was a little bit fatter, a, a fatter wine than I than I wanted. So we dialed it back to fifty fifty. So the stainless um gives like a little bit more freshness and sort of crisp, clean acidity, and then the lees contact. So lees are the um the yeast and other sediments that settle from the wine uh, to the bottom of the vessel that they're in. Uh, and that lees can um, give a creamy texture to the wine. So uh, for Chardonnay, for example, we actually stir the barrels to mix those lees back into the wine. Uh, and while I didn't do that with this Pinot Gris, the, just the lees contact um, in barrel uh, does build a, a nice component. So uh, do you want to, uh, do you want to demonstrate how you taste wine? Sure. I did actually just put together a whole step-by-step uh, -step, uh, sort of tasting 101, how to evaluate the sight, smell, and sips, right? Okay, so let's do it. Um, picking the right glassware and serving the wine at the right temperature is a mm -hmm. good start. Often people serve white wines much colder than I would recommend coming straight out of the fridge is, is cold. So if you want to be able to get the full expression of your wine in glass, pull it out of the fridge half an hour early, let it warm up to, you know, 12 degrees, 11 degrees, uh, and you'll, you'll get a lot more out of it. Um, and then I sort of tilt the wine away from me on an angle just to get a look at, you know, the clarity uh, or looking at the rim of the wine. Uh, is it, um, you know, intense color in the rim? Is it a watery rim? How dark is the, even with white wine, how yellow is it indicates what the variety could be. Uh, Chardonnay tends to have a deeper yellow color and Pinot Gris tends to be more of like a straw yellow. Mm -hmm. um, and then we give it a swirl. And um, for beginners swirling, I'll give the advice to keep the glass on the table and use the table as the I don't know if you can see me from here, but it's much easier to swirl the wine if you've got the base of the glass on the table. Right. Uh, and then the smell is the best part for me. It's um. We spend most of our time in training with the diploma. Uh, we always would say like, uh, you know, 50% of the effort around your tasting note, everything seems to come from, you know, you look at it, you swirl it, but you spend uh, the most time inhaling aromas and from different you know degrees but to have perspective on what we're going to taste because everything's informed really by your nose yeah and even what you're tasting on the palate is really it's your nose doing the work mm -hmm. um our tongue is able to detect uh just a few things but your nose um will retronasally so when your the wine is in your mouth you're still smelling uh but retronasally um so yeah, I you'll notice on the labels, we've opted not to include um, tasting descriptors. Mm. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. The first being, I don't necessarily want to tell what people tell people what they should be experiencing. I want them to experience it on their own um, and describe it for themselves. Um, and also wine evolves over time, right? So what you know, we say when it goes on the label in three years, maybe that's not valid anymore. So do you want to talk about the aromas that you're getting on this wine and then the flavors on your palate? Sure. So um, I love the tree fruit profile of this. Mm -hmm. I think there's really nice sort of peachy apricot character. Um, and then uh, what I love about um, Happy Valley and Garnet Valley is um, the distinctive minerality. There's like a lean note of minerality that comes through. Totally. If you've and people often are confused with the term minerality because it is a bit of an abstract one, but like there is a okay. smell to like like rain on yeah. like wet stone. You know when you can yeah. smell that smell in the air. I think that's 
that I'm comes looking, through. I'm looking one. those gravel rocks in K2, you know, like totally I'm those rocks. And the other thing is there's a floral note on this that Pinot Grigio just doesn't have flowers. It has fruit. But I think Pinot Gris often, if you're looking for a marker, it's this delicate floral white blossomy kind of note. And it carries through the palette in kind of a perfumed way. Um, and I do get like uh, that beautiful kind of peach, fleshy peach, um, maybe a little bit on the greener side, greener apricot, but it's it's lush. This is very round and mouth filling and rich. And yet when we come right to the end, it's like there's like a an, uh, an axe that falls and it just cleans your palate and it's super crisp. And it's like, what just happened? been there that's amazing it's so good anyway kind of well, delighted I, I love that because it's one of the I mean balance is what we talk about and why like you yes. want this balance you don't want anything any part of it to really stand out in a um a disjointed kind of way and to have that sort of um mouth filling character but still the structure of um some acidity to give it a nice finish is is really what we were going for well, I didn't tell you, but um, aside from sparkling wine and maybe being in, you know, places where sparkling wine and champagne are abundant, um, Alsatian whites are some of my most favorite whites. Like, I just called it the Holy Grail. I wrote a whole mm. bunch about it. It's so obsessive. But anyway, um, having said that, the experience of those wines is similar to this in that it's mouth filling, but it's just this acidity, I would say um, richer, richer than I think. So the fruit was nice and ripe and had lots of flavor. You don't have high alcohol here. So it's kind of a super, super careful job you did making sure that, you know, as you said, it's in balance. Like, mm. so yeah, the most important decision is, I think, as you alluded to, is the harvest decision, right? To harvest the grapes at the optimal time is really the key to everything, right? If you can get, if you can get that right. So I imagine you, I easy. imagine you out in the vineyard tasting grapes like every day. Is that what happens? I don't have a traditional breakfast leading into harvest. It's great grapes in the vineyard and being out there every day. <laughs> it is. I mean. Um, we do take them back. I do some lab testing, like we're testing for pH, we're testing for sugar levels, but ultimately it comes down to what the flavors are, right? We're out in the vineyard, um, tasting the different blocks and the different clones and uh, trying much. to schedule schedule the pick. Uh, so there was a guy in Australia, there was a brand in Australia and I don't remember, maybe it was like Pelham, I don't know. Anyway, the label, oh, uh, uh, the label was called Jim Jim and he had a dog you might remember this story and the dog would whenever the dog would eat the grapes he knew the grapes were ripe so maybe you need a dog so you don't have to have grapes for brunch every day in the <laughs> Barb we have a bear that's our gauge when the bear comes and starts eating the grapes at night and they take a lot of grapes the bear can eat the bear can eat quite a lot in an evening um, yeah, that's the signal. The grapes are ready. The bears are here. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be in the vineyard when I hear the rustling in the bushes. And... <laughs> this is kind of a funny story, like, because we don't, obviously, we don't, I love to see bears, but we don't really want them in the vineyard. So, you know, we've tried to, we have a fence line trying to keep them out. And Matt, he couldn't figure out where are these bears coming in every night? Because they leave evidence, right? They're breaking through the fence or what have you. And we discovered that they just weren't leaving. They were up in the tree and we're just wandering around underneath and mama bear and two cubs were hanging out for the day and then coming down and feasting at night. Um, yeah, but well, not they her. Had, they had it so good. I sure <laughs> didn't want to leave. That's incredible. Um, yeah. You know, uh, our footprint is, of course, in nature and, you know, we're pushing up against the boundaries. And so I'm sure there's some encounters with uh, wildlife. I think the bear story is great. Um, what other kinds of things have you seen? Uh, like wildlife? Um, one of our biggest pressures actually is bird because um, we've tried to keep the natural landscape as 
um, well, there's that possible. forest. That forest runs right across the back of K two. Yeah, so a lot of a lot of perch points there for birds. So um, our inputs on netting, trying to get nets out over the grapes, is top priority for us. So another really big uh, labor input for a vineyard like that. Um, where most wineries have some bird pressure, but ours is higher than average uh, because of the location. Yeah. So let's talk about sustainability then, because I know you've kind of alluded to some of the things, but, um, you know, being in nature and trying not to disturb, you know, this whole space and it's not commercial vineyard property, it's a state, it's careful, it's careful attention to the vines and the soil and the harvest and like all the details. So, you know, we talk about sustainability, like, oh, people, planets, profit. And it sounds so, so easy, so sweet. Just like, you know, here's a little checklist. We're just going to check everything off. But the realities of it, I think, are quite different. So maybe you want to talk a little bit about the things that you're doing or the things that uh, you hope to do or the things that are, you know, they're not working, like forget about it. But like water, what, electricity, um, human capital, like there's, there's so much to talk about. So maybe you just start and I'll, I'll follow along. Yeah. I mean, I mentioned sustainability before that's, um, the word that I would use to describe us. We are, um, the philosophy is to ideally we're leaving the land better than we received it in a better condition. And I think it, to achieve balance in wine, uh, you have to achieve balance uh, in the vineyard and that comes with healthy soils um, and yeah, balanced microflora and, and all of that. Um, so excessive spraying in a conventional way is not something we're interested in doing. Um, we're not also interested in becoming certified organic necessarily because my philosophy is um, we're not just ch checking boxes. We're making every decision on a case by case basis for what is best uh, in that situation. Um, and to be perfectly honest, in my view, um, using one non-organic spray uh, in the right way to target exactly what you want to target once is could be better than spraying something that's certified organic you know, 50 times and it's not doing what, what you need. Uh, I'm not saying that's what's happening at organic vineyards, no, no. but I'm just saying but those that, are the, those like, are the risks. Those are the risks on the side of the organic farming compound is that you've got uh, no lat no uh, room for any variation along that uh, to, or otherwise you risk losing your certification is my yeah. understanding. So yeah. that very rigid, kind of very rigid in a farming community, maybe a very rigid approach. I, th I think in a lot of ways, yes. I mean, it does give good general guidelines that we are following almost to the letter. I mean, one of the big ones to get away from is um, weed spray, because that that's the tough one if you're organic. Mm. Yeah, it's, you know, that that's the, the hardest one. And we're um, not completely free, but... Um, we're using, for example, straw under vine uh, as a, a replacement for that landscaping fabric. Um, you know, you can use a grape hoe to actually mechanically remove weeds. So um, there are uh, things that we're doing that way uh, to reduce the need for any of these things. Um, I really like this, the uh, straw conversation because it doesn't just function to suppress the weeds, it, it acts in a threefold way. So it suppresses the weeds, um, improves the organic matter of the soil, builds the health of the soil, and it helps us with water retention. So for you, to your point about uh, water conservation, especially for our site, which is very rocky, very steep, where we have a lot of runoff, that um, straw serves to retain the water where we want it, um, and thereby using less. Right. I, I love some of these uh, um, tricks or tools that uh, you have uh, to explore to find the solutions you need. Like, are there some others that come to mind? You know, I mean, gosh, forest fires and then drought and then deep freeze. And like, we're really, we're really at the edge of what seems to be um, possible for farming. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we haven't had our shortage of challenges. 
um, the forest fires the first year at Silvero actually it was 2018 was the first year that the um, vines produced grapes uh, and we opted not to bottle that vintage because that was the year um, I think Matt thought he was going to lose the vineyard the fire mm -hmm. burned right up to the property line so um, the wine was affected and that wasn't certainly how we want to represent um, our winery any year um, yeah. and certainly not in our first release so yeah. opted uh, not to bottle that and then 2019 became uh our first vintage but um those are huge yeah. decisions those are huge financial decisions mm -hmm. i mean they're huge i agreed yes yeah so you know what's the future of boutique wineries in the okanagan valley um i i, I, get, I think back to the beginning of our conversation i think it's a bit of a turning point right now i really hope that uh, I mean, we have a very diverse um, set of wineries right now. There's, uh, you know, there's larger corporations, but there's medium size. There's majority are family owned, family operated small wineries. Uh, and I'm certainly going to do everything in my, my power to make sure um, that continues. So I think having that diversity is part of the charm, right? Yeah, well, let's look, if we looked at the landscape of businesses in the world, I mean, you know, we have those corporations and then we have like the new growth AI, you know, hoo, hoo, hoo. but, you know, it's been the driver of the economy for as long as I've been around that uh, anything mom and pop, you know, one to one to 10 employees is like making all of this progress or all of this uh, effort uh, to sustain themselves and um, you know they're really an engine so I would feel like it's just uh, it's a it ends up becoming a numbers game so how do you create do you create a cooperative then for you know family wineries they don't all need to buy you know bodily machines they don't all need to buy you know you know maybe there's a, like the crush pad idea or like I mean I know this is like old news but um, you know you can't predict nature but you know you can take your best guess and, uh, you know, help each other out. So, you know, I think that's what you were kind of alluding to. So how does the helping each other out look like? What does that look like in Summerland? Was oh, I just had a meeting with uh, all the wineries um, yesterday and everybody's kind of like every single one is coming together to work as a group with a common vision uh, and sharing resources and advice. And um, I think that helps us from um, communication perspective, communicating effectively what we are doing to the community, if to the consumer, if we all have you know, a common vision um, and, and how to achieve that. And I, I just love that uh, you know, everyone was on board, open and ready to share. And that's the one thing that I've seen um, improve over my years here that um, when I first started, maybe it was a little bit more, you know, you know, um, keeping your cards close to your chest and not like yeah, worried about the competition. Trust. Yeah, there's a trust, there's a trust element. And there's also us versus the world kind of an element too, right? So um, and once I think the car, the tides sort of shift, like I think New Zealand has shown us for a long time that, you know, this is a community that gets together and they work together and they make, you know, a lot happen. 99% of the producers are sustainable farmers, uh, you know, awesome. Um, and, and you want, um, I, I don't think competition in wine is, is very different. Like the neighbor can't copy what you're doing because it's a different site. You're working with a different material. Like you you just have a different starting point. Um so I don't view it as competing. Yeah. I want all of the wineries in Summerland and BC to produ be producing fantastic wine uh, because that benefits the reputation of the region right. as a whole. Right. Yeah. So how, how, like, you know, what I was just thinking is like the more wineries in Summerland, the more reason for people to come to Summerland and drive around. So I'm just curious how many, you know, were there quite a few people that just kind of discovered Solvero randomly, you know, driving on, because I feel like that's been a big promotion for Summerland. Uh, I wrote a story about it in last, last spring because it was like, wait a minute, I never go to Summerland. Yeah, I think um, there's some untapped potential there. It's, uh, you know, a little bit off the beaten path, right? You have to go off the highway into 
um, more of a bottleneck drive, right? It's, it's not just a, a straight shot from one end to the other with, you know, wineries all, all along the way. You're going, you know, around and up and down and um, there's all different pockets. And I think that speaks to why we have three different sub uh, GIs there. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I think there's potential for people to um, discover Summerland for the first time. And certainly the comment that I get from everybody that comes out to Garnet Valley is that even people that live in Summerland have never come out to Garnet Valley. So mm -hmm. it's just... so new. It's so yeah. new. It's so yeah. new. It's so beautiful. Uh, worth the trip. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, maybe we should talk about the Pinot Noir because like the uh, onophiles that are just crazy over Pinot Noir, they're going to be so excited uh, to hear the story about you know, Silvero, Summerland, and um, there's a few other producers in that kind of area that are doing pretty delicious things. So uh, yeah, I'm pretty proud of our Pinot Noir. Do you have ah. a bottle here? So Excellent. 2020. So we had 2022 and now 2020. So did you hold this back at the winery? So yeah, so we just uh, sold out of our 2019 and opted to release the 2020 um uh, release that um the end of last year so fall of last year um and then we won't be releasing the 2021 until it's uh ready at the end of this summer um that's kind of what i'm predicting so uh, i will point out if you hold that label up again that that um shape on the front reflects the uh the garnet valley vineyard or the pinot noir section of it so those or the vineyard blocks uh, where the Pinot Noir was harvested from. It's like a perfect um, triangle with like uh, smaller triangles inside of it. So that's, I love the texture of the label too. It kind of gives the impression that, yeah, we've got some rocks here. That's the same, the Pinot Noir, or sorry, the Pinot Gris label is a bit more of rectangular, but again, it's got that same treatment of uh, texture. So like, do you know how many plants, how many vines you have at uh so how many vines? vines. Oh yeah, my how goodness. How many rows? Like, yeah, there's like some people actually have numbers like, oh yeah, it's like. We do have numbers. I, I don't know <laughs> off the top of my head because every block is numbered up to. So like our um, spring block, I think has about 48 rows in it. Um, and our standard density blocks uh, have about 1600 plants per acre, but we do have a high density block of Chardonnay that's over 3,000, like 3,300 vines an acre. So um, I'd have to get out my calculator to be. <laughs> to well, be our, our, so the uh, high density Chardonnay, is there uh, uh, some ideas around what we're going to do with high density Chardonnay vines? Like, uh, the yes. berries will be different. Sorry, the what will, will the berries, the fruit be different, like the bunches? Yeah, the idea with high density is that you get the same yield per acre overall, uh, but each vine individually produces less. Um, and the goal with that is uh, more premium quality and concentration. So right. we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be using that block for like sparkling wine, for example, we'd be using it for our estate grown Chardonnay and that like true barrel fermented style, um, oak aged for 10, 11 months. Um, and yeah, the idea is to drive complexity and quality um, by planting in that way. Um, but it is like everything else on the vineyard, this, this is the hardest block to farm because again, very steep and you can't fit a tractor in, right? And they're planted so close together, um, like push behind tractor, backpacks, right? Like it, everything is, you know, by hand and walking to the most extreme level. So do you have to hook on to the posts in the vine rows to like with a with a belt like in the Mosul where you got to climb up you know and you want to be you don't want to fall because I mean I just wanted to point out this is this lovely cork that I got out of the Pinot Noir and what I love about it is it says Solvero and then it's got the lines like a barrel I'm I'm assuming that is to match kind of the texture of the soil that yeah yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. good branding good branding yeah good. I'm I love um, I certainly didn't <laughs> didn't design them myself, but uh, yeah, I love the. I think it speaks to the authenticity. And I will mention a common question that we get is the name Solvero. Where did that come from? It's oh. not the family name. Uh, it is a Latin translation uh, meaning truth in soil. So soul can be um, soil oh, or sun, and vero is is truth. 
So soul barrel, truth in soil. How apropos, mm -hmm. truth in soil. And of course the soils, I was, as I recall, like, um, bricky clay rocky like and, and when I say clay it was all dry and kind of brittle and you know uh you, you it's water st or stressed I don't know if that's the right term but like it, it it doesn't get a lot of water and so therefore I I'm assuming you know vines go deep and um but it's certainly a unique vineyard mm, yes on. Like, oh yes very much so I mean glacial soils um like mm -hmm. I mean the Okanagan and Garnet Valley were had by glaciers so that's uh, common to everyone um but the bedrock is closer to the surface for us so there's a lot of um um uh, rocks that are from that um so granitic uh, bedrock materials uh very sandy gravelly um a bit more loam and oh, i should mention that we did just plant some gamay too that's one thing i haven't talked about so we have just planted that last year and that's more of a sandy loam kind of character um but yeah very well draining soils should force the roots to go down nice and deep um and and translate to something pretty cool in the glass love gamay gamay mm -hmm. is delicious there's a few good producers of gamay uh, in the valley, I was I was uh, also hearing that uh, there's been some uh, talk of Grenache and mm -hmm. other. Do you want to do you want to walk through the tasting of this? Sure. It's it's you know it's it's not as translucent as I thought it might be. It's got very good color, like you can see that. It's uh, sometimes BC Pinot Noir can be very thin in its appearance very mm. see-through and transparent and opaque yeah this is not that no we get some really good intensity um and that comes with um again back to that sort of sunlight hours that we get the narrowness of the valley we get really great concentration and intensity without hitting those high alcohol levels for with pinot noir elsewhere it's more of a challenge because you don't get that intensity until you hit say you know 23 24% sugar and then that translates to like 14% or something in the finished wine uh this is more like um 13% or below the 2019 actually was 12.2% and it had that similar intensity right so wow. um that speaks to the wow. vineyard site and this does is too, does it speak to great brightness too yes yeah, I think so. The physiological ripeness that yes, we're shooting for. Yeah, does it say the alcohol on here? It well, does. I don't have that bottle in front of me at the right. moment. So uh, the clones. Of course, yeah. 115-887-777-828-943, Swan and Pomard. 33% new French oak, 12 months in barrel. 450 cases. Wow, look at that yield. One ton per acre. That mm. is tiny. I think I can just tell by the aromas already. This has got this beautiful perfumed nose. Um, sweet, like not roses, but like sweet fruit, like cherries. But it's not uh, sweet in terms of sugar. It's just this beautiful ripeness that I think comes across. So love that. Yeah, for the wine geeks out there that are interested in clones of grapes. Um, Pinot Noir is um, the variety that we most commonly talk about them with. And I guess to simplify it, I would say that a clone is like a subspecies of Pinot Noir. It is like a cutting from a plant that exhibited a particular characteristic, whether that was a type of growth habit or cluster size, um, a variable that differentiated it from uh, another plant. And then that was propagated as a separate, what we call clone. Um, and I find that with Pinot Noir, um, certainly in this vineyard, it's the one grape variety I can taste, like the grape in the vineyard and, and taste the differences between the clones and the different sites. Pinot Gris, Chardonnay, they don't um, show that the same way, but there's clones of different types of clones of those grape mm -hmm. varieties as well. Mm -hmm. um, but Pinot Noir really showcases uh, beautiful differences. Um, and I love having the seven different types to work with. I was because say, that's just tremendous. Uh, it is. To think about how to layer complexity uh, into a glass of wine. Yeah, it's, I think, I think of it as having 
like more paints on your palette, right? Because that everyone brings a different um, profile uh, from flavor and texture to tan and intensity. Um, I find the clones six, six, seven, and eight to eight tend to have darker fruit character and bring more intensity and tannin structure. Where one one five is, I call that our, our workhorse clone. You consistently get you know cherry aromas, but it's a little bit leaner and lighter. So uh, do you want to do you want to just walk through this one? The colors, the colors like great. The color yeah, is that's... beautiful ruby. It's kind of medium. You can you can see through it, but it's not translucent. Like it's not uh, watery in any way. There's a, a a density to the color. Yeah, and that's a Pinot Noir is um, the reason why some are can appear lighter. Um, it is a thin skinned grape variety. And of course that's where all the color comes from. So sometimes it can be a, a challenge to get color extraction from Pinot Noir. Uh, we don't really have that problem uh, because of the site and uh, how it ripens. Um, I don't do really extended skin contact. I mean, it did see over about 25 days on skins. So mm -hmm. not, um, so I'd say fairly average, uh, yeah. just over three weeks on skins. Yeah. Uh, everything by hand, hand punched down. So we constantly mix the skins back in with the wine as it's fermenting to try and optimize that color. Um, and what I'm shooting for with this Pinot Noir, I hope that the fruit is what, what you get first. Um, I like kind of the darker fruit characters, a little bit yeah. of floral, maybe a hint of cola, and then um, some earthy spice. I love that kind of just a, a hint of old world uh, in there yeah. too, um, yeah. to, to round it out. It uh, has a, a really um, a finish that is also, um, it captures some of that minerality that you talked about uh, in the Pinot Gris, just at the end, um, it's dry, it's so lovely and dry, but there's this nice um, sort of mouth coating, flavor of um sort of this bruised dark fruit but then there's this minerality that's just kind of sitting with it it's really lovely mm. Mm. Yum. glad you're enjoying be proud yeah. of that one that would that would be a that would be a great uh buff bourguignon or uh i don't know i just have that on its own it's delicious it's a pretty versatile wine that's one of the reasons i love pinot noir too because it has has that intensity um, but it is, it's not like, um, um, a cab soap, you know, like what is, it's... well, this has a lot of acidity. I would say, uh, uh, what I like about Pinot Noir is that it brings acidity to a meal, mm. um, and a lightness. Um, I would, I feel like the, everything's in balance. Like there's no sharp edges here. Uh, so I'm guessing like, did you say alcohol was 13 or 14%? It's, it's not high. It should um, be on the back label there, just at the bottom left. Uh, just above the website it says red wine, 750 mils. Oh, I there think. it is. 22.7. Yeah. No, that's not right. 12, 12.7. That's uh, I was going to say 12.8, but I, yeah, I was close. So we love, so low alcohol wines, no alcohol wines. What's going on? What the heck? What the heck's going on? Yeah, I'm not sure. I, um, yeah, I mean, that's a topic of conversation right now in the industry as well, like low or no alcohol movements, which for me, I feel like premium boutique wines are kind of exempt in a way from that conversation because this isn't something that is a binge drinking category. It's not promoted that way. This is wine is food, like you're having a glass to enhance your meal. And I think there is actually health benefits associated with that. Mm -hmm. Um there's a place for non-alcohol, low alcohol options. I think it's cool that you're seeing mocktails on lists and, you know, nobody's promoting drinking and driving. That's for sure. I think having those alternatives and normalizing them is a, a great thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I hope it doesn't, you know, take away from what it is that we're doing uh, I uh, no, I think you make a really good point. You know, it's the barefoots and the apothics that are like really struggling, you know, Gallo is having a huge review of all of its category because, you know, where it made a lot of money was in this manufactured wine category. And I, I always say to people, it's kind of like food. It's kind of like fast food. It's fast wine, yeah. you know, yeah. and this is not fast wine. This is slow wine. This is in that category of care and attention and artisan and like, 
you know, totally different. So, yeah. you know, I, I think you're right. I think you're right about that. Uh, I just have to convince my kids that alcohol is not bad uh, because right now alcohol is bad and pardon me, alcohol is bad and gummies are good. So it's like, what? yeah, that's, I, you know what, I, I don't know where the uh, future trends will go, but um, yeah, I think future generations will continue to discover the beauty and magic of of because, premium wines be, like, yes because it is an experience mm -hmm. it is going to a place it is this entire holistic kind of ex it's this thing that happens when you first had that amazing wine that sparked your imagination that changed your mind that got you interested or that brought you to to wine uh, because in a place like uh, Solvero where you're sitting in this beautiful valley and the sun might be going down and it casts its shadows and you're at the tasting room and maybe you're sitting out front and it's just magic. It's magic. The birds are singing, right? You know, it's like pretty quiet. There's maybe crickets. It's like, it's like, it's like put your phone away and yeah. be here now and uh, experience something that has been crafted. And we love craft beer. I'm not going to call this craft wine, but it's certainly, uh, it, it, it's this premium boutique estate, you know, wine from a place, uh, that I think, you know, I don't know, uh, I could go on about it, but, and I would say, well, I'm female, so maybe I go on and gush about it, uh, <laughs> and I shouldn't, but, um, yeah, it's all about the emotions that come up when you have the experience of, of a, a nice glass of wine with someone that you care about, so hundred percent. I think that's a, a beautiful thing. I have faith that uh, that will Carry continue on. to be appreciated. Yeah. Do you have a memory of that first bottle or is there some bottle that stood out for you in the last? Uh, gosh, a memory that comes to mind. There's been a lot over the years <laughs> that are meaningful. Um, one that I remember from a few years ago now was um tasting a cab sold with a great friend of mine who'd moved to, uh, she'd moved back to Australia, that's where she's from. Um, and we were Kangaroo Island, I think. And we ordered a bottle of uh, St. Hugo Cabernet Sauvignon. I think it was, I can't remember what vintage now, this was a little while ago, but I'd been sort of off Cabernet Sauvignon and the Aussie ones too. Like, I'm not sure that the representation we get on the shelf here is accurately what reflects you? what you can get. Um, and it just was like, it renewed my love and appreciation for this great variety. Like it had ripeness, but there was like mint and it was, uh, yeah, it was round and rich and, uh, yeah, it, it was just a really special time, you know, bonding with a friend that I hadn't seen in a while, uh, and rediscovering this type of wine. Yeah, I had a number of things going for it. <laughs> yeah, because it is true. Like it is the environment that you're in. So, like sometimes uh, people will experience wine very differently. They taste a wine. They're in, you know, a dim lit room. They're having a wonderful time. Their mood is high. They love the people and the atmosphere. And then they take all this wine with them and then they taste it somewhere else. And it's a different experience. Yeah. They don't even perceive it as being the same. So there's that contextual and totally yeah. is the yeah. moon full is the moon waning or waxing I don't yeah. know. Like, <laughs> need to think about all those things mm -hmm. uh so um tell me is there anything that we haven't touched on that you'd like to talk about oh gosh I think we've covered all manner I of covered, we covered topics all the way around <laughs> so uh how many years have you been in the Okanagan Valley now uh, so 2008, I guess I won't count because I had to go back to Ontario to finish my thesis. So how long ago? 2009 onwards. So it's 15 years. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. You're officially a BC or now. I, I think so. Folks from Ontario appreciate that, but <laughs> uh, it gives them a good excuse to come out to visit, which they do pretty regularly. So uh, that's, that's good. good. That's mm -hmm. good. Well, yeah. uh, Solvero, uh, you know, we if, if we just summarize a little bit, so Solvero, um, you can visit the website, 
uh, wines are for sale online. You have a wine club, I'm assuming. We um, do. Yeah. yeah. A fully customizable one. And uh, we're setting limits on it because of our limited inventory. Well, will um, prices go up, do you think? I mean, so you have to consider that too. How do you finance your business if the prices don't go up and it's a limited thing? And I'm just talking as a real true and true capitalist. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there is a, a business reality that has to yeah. be looked at, but yeah. um, I can't speak for sure to decisions that happen a year out, but for now there's- So what, it, we, say, so what we say now is get sign up now and order your wine now because prices will be going up. <laughs> yeah, there you go, yeah. Uh, we don't have plans to raise the prices in the foreseeable future, but as uh, circumstances I described earlier, um, we, we have to look um, more closely at that and what makes sense for the business. But um, yeah. Well, I heard uh, there was some talk of bringing grapes in either from Ontario or other parts and relaxing the VQA um, you know, reg restrictions. Uh, what do you think? Is that a reality? Uh, so I would clarify that I don't think anybody's talking about labeling something BQA, BC BQA, if it's not BC grapes. So they would, yeah. It would be a different category, right? So um, potentially uh, the conversations are Ontario and then you create a different category that's a Canada BQA, that would be an option. Oh. So Canadian wine, um, it's not BC BQA, it's not Ontario BC. VQA right, it's right Canada VQA that so that's sense. one it does so that's one conversation and then um the other conversation that does make some sense as a temporary stopgap but not involving VQA at all would be like Washington grapes which is stylistically more similar to what we're doing in BC um and the idea would be to source um premium grapes so grapes from Washington but um fermented and crafted um, by winemakers in, in BC. Um, but there's obviously regulations that yeah, have logistics. to be navigated, yeah. logistics. And, you know, we, we, our whole philosophy is truth. So making sure to communicate what we're doing to the consumer in um, an authentic, um, uh, effective way. Um, one thing that we're really hoping is, you know, back to the fact that most wineries in BC are small family run wineries, um, that are, you know, hardworking farmers that are just trying to make a go of it. It's, you know, people aren't, we're not breaking it in hand over fist. Yeah. It really is a labor of love. And we hope that, um, our consumer will, uh, support, um, our industry through, uh, through a difficult year. I think, uh, I think there is a, a pretty committed group out there. I don't know how large the BC wine group is, but you know, you never know if you rally, uh, with, you know, the right messaging, maybe it's yeah. a whole BC wide. I mean, we already love by BC because we identify how we can support our own industry. We've got save on foods. It's packed to the gills with, you know, BC wine. And why isn't everybody buying? It's the best deal going, you know, buy four bottles, you get 10% off, buy a dozen bottles. We'll throw in another dollar off a bottle. Like it's the best shop and buy wine deal in the lower mainland. So, you know, there are places that support will come from in terms of, you know, the distribution partners, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, I think you mentioned something earlier too, is that, you know, the thing we get a lot of is wine from other countries that really uh, isn't a s signature artisan boutique styles from those regions. Like I just think of South Africa and Australia and I'm just like, oh my God, like we just get the $10, $15, like grab and go and cheap and cheerful. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think sometimes we have a misunderstanding of what wine is and where it's from. And yeah. so that conversation about bringing people to the Okanagan and bringing them to your winery and teaching them and teaching your staff. And like, you know, I'm sure you have all kinds of hurdles, but, um, you know, getting people on board as your biggest fans and then being the cheerleaders, that will make a huge difference for Solvero. It will make a huge difference for Summerland. Um, yeah. it'll, it'll make a difference for BC wine and I do really believe that it's the, one of the most beautiful wine countries I've been in like it it's, has a lot of charm yeah 
Oh, hundred percent. It's, it's so unique. Um, and yeah, I, I think the future is bright. Um, there are, but with farming, there are cycles of events that can happen. And um, yeah, this past winter just happened to be quite a cold one, but. Uh, Have they been talking about what it's going to look like going, what our summer's going to look like? Uh, I haven't heard too much talk of that. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to comment uh, on it. I'm, um, if there has, I think we're so focused on what happened this past winter. I was going to say, <laughs> focus on what, and you've got 50 barrels of Pinot Noir that you get to taste every day to figure out what you're going to do. So yeah, I think that's awesome. Focusing on that. And I should mention, you know, business will continue as usual for 2024 because we are bottling and releasing the vintage from 2023. And in the case of reds, uh, even before that, um, mm -hmm. any shortage of fruit uh, this year will affect business in 2025. So it's not that wineries won't be open. Right. You know, we yeah. want you to come business and visit. Business as usual. Yep. Business yep. as yep. usual. Yeah. Come and, come, and, come and meet Allison at the winery. So Solvero, S-O-L-V-E-R-O. -E uh, I think it's a website, uh, Solvero Vineyards. Uh, so Solvero Wines. Winery. Oh, silverowines. Yeah, silverowines. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, if there is nothing further, lovely to chat. Always great to see you. Uh, I like the bear story, so I think we're going to have to find some more of those. That was very. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and, Glad you uh, like that. I'll be I'll be in the Okanagan in March, so I'll stop by and take say hello. That uh, would be fantastic. I look forward to seeing you in person. Yeah, thank you so much for the wine. I am double fisted as we say goodbye. So um, I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening and I look forward to talking to you soon. All the best. Likewise. Take Thanks care. so much, Barb. Yeah, bye. Bye.